okay good evening so <coughs> today uh, we'll continue our discussion on slow viscous flows past spheres because there are certain other uh, conditions which we have to consider into account uh, that we will discuss and apart from that <coughs> uh, we will also quickly talk about the non spherical particles so <coughs> typically when we have non spherical situations then uh, in such scenarios there are high chances that uh, uh, these non spherical situations we will be able to solve in viscous flow scenarios uh, particularly if, when solid particles are present and when we see that there is slight inertia present in the system then typically the uh, shape of the fluid particles cannot be <coughs> considered constant so there will be significant changes in the shape so that's why we have to account for the fluid inertia so uh, what we will be doing we will try to quickly summarize the solid particles flow over solid particles in the viscous resign because uh, in majority of our discussion solid particles will not be of much importance we will try to consider the gas liquid multiphase flows okay and uh, <coughs> in the subsequent lecture quickly then we will discuss about the flow over solid particles at finite Reynolds number so that we will summarize in the next lecture so before uh, uh, going into further discussion let us first consider our spherical particles only and in the previous lecture we established that uh, in case of fluid particles whatever the hetmer risky solution was there uh, that is nothing but coming as a limiting case and majority of the experimental evidence shows that our fluid particles is having velocity equal to that of Stokes velocity only. Okay, so one of the typical reasons, so there were many theories to explain why there is the difference but one of the well accepted theory was effect of surface contamination. So how effect of surface contamination actually changes our solution that we will try to see. So our first assumption is that the small amount of contaminant is present in the system which will be actually diminishing the internal circulation whereas we do not have any change in the bulk fluid property. So our contaminant is so small that it is actually not influencing the bulk fluid properties. Our second assumption is that we can have significant increase in the drag force and drastic reduction in mass and heat transfer rates if contaminant is present because what contaminant presence of contaminant is doing it is altering the surface tension because of which the internal circulation is diminishing so if there is no internal flow then ultimately we will be finding that mode of heat or mass transfer will be purely because of the diffusion effects on contrary if there is internal circulation present then some advection will also come into picture and we know that transfer or exchange of properties because of the advection or convection effect is actually more in comparison to the pure diffusion. So that's why we will be experiencing reduction in mass and heat transfer rates. Okay. And whatever the uh, fluid pairs which will be affected by this phenomenon, these will be the fluid pairs having high surface tension. These are more prone to this effect because in these cases we will be experiencing the drastic reduction in the value of surface tension. Then uh, so if we consider at the practical level then it is impossible to avoid impurities and purity can only be maintained at the initial injection of the fluids into the system and after some time we will be finding that somehow our system will get contaminated and then these internal circulations will be actually diminishing. Okay. So, now it is also important that when surface contaminant is actually affecting the system then how much is the amount of the contaminant and what is the nature of impurity because there can be certain contaminant particles present in the system which are actually not altering the surface tension. So the particles which are not altering the surface tension their sizes are very small in comparison to the size of the sphere under consideration. So these particles will not influence the system. So system will be influenced by only those particles which have effect on the surface tension of the fluid. Okay. So 
greatest retarding effect is for insoluble contaminants because if you have some contaminant which is actually soluble in the bulk of the fluid medium so there will be less chances of that particular contaminant to stay near the interface so that uh, particular contaminant can be present in the bulk of the other medium so that's why uh, whatever the majorly effect will be coming that will be because of the insoluble contaminants and particularly those with, which are having high surface pressure so because of the high pressure uh, surface pressures these will try to stay close to the interfaces and practically important cases are if we have say insoluble particles in the dispersed phase so that type of actually effect we will try to consider and if there is effect of any ions in the solution and double layer adjacent to the interface that effect we are actually not talking about because whenever charged ions are present at the interface these also have some effect to vary the surface tension so particularly we are not considering that type of situ uh, situations over here these type of systems are actually dealt slight differently okay so uh, Frumkin and Levitch they have actually assumed that contaminants was soluble in the continuous phase and distributed over the interface. So any contaminant which will be soluble in the continuous phase that can have chances to get absorbed to the interface but it will not diffuse into the dispersed phase if it is actually insoluble in the dispersed phase. So that's why. Uh, it will try to accumulate near the interface. So this was the first assumption. So they have provided the first uh, solution. So typically whenever they considered the solution, they tried to determine the contamination of the interface because of the three effects. So the first effect was adsorption and desorption tactics. Okay. So say contaminants were being adsorbed or at the interface or these are being dissolved from the interface. So this is nothing but a surface phenomena. So there is nothing to do with the bulk fluid motion over here. Okay, So this is adsorption and desorption is nothing but a surface phenomena which will only take place at the interface. So if particles are being adsorbed by the interface then there will be drastic decrease in the surface tension if particles are actually dissolved by the surface uh, uh, free, uh, this uh, interface then there will be actually normal effect of the surface tension okay then second is diffusion in the continuous phase okay so if you consider that your particles are present at this interface but these have some diffusion dynamics towards the continuous phase okay so if diffusion dynamics is strong in that case these will try to move away from the interface but if say diffusion is not much strong then these will try to actually attach near the interface and third point is surface diffusion in the interface. The meaning of surface diffusion is that if say you consider a homogeneous situation that particles are homogeneously distributed over the surface. So if there is no surface diffusion then all the particles will stay here only. But if there is surface diffusion then it may happen that particles will try to accumulate to some one portion of the surface and other portion of the surface will be actually free from the particles. Okay. So these three effects actually parallelly happens at the smaller scales and depending upon their dominance the terminal velocity of the particle is actually influenced. Okay. So there is this formula for terminal velocity of the particle 2 by 3 g a square delta rho by mu and then it is having this 1 plus k by 2 plus 3 k term. So up to this, this formula is nothing but identical to 1 what we have actually seen earlier. Okay. But now one additional term is introduced over here c by mu and 3 c by mu. So over here if you refer c is nothing but called the retardation coefficient and the value of c will be different for each of these three different phenomena. Okay, so depending upon which phenomenon is actually taking place in the gas liquid uh, system, depending upon that, the value of this coefficient C will be changing. Okay. 
and typically in this analysis it is assumed that when this factor of retardation coefficient is considered it is assumed that these are nothing but there are symmetric internal circulations so internal circulations are symmetric it means if you have this as axis of symmetry around this you have formation of symmetric rows there is no asymmetry in the row so that is the assumption okay however in practice if you see there will be asymmetric internal circulations so sevik was the one who first attempted to analyze effect of strong surface active contaminants which were insoluble in both the phases so if some uh, surfactants are there which are not soluble in any of the phase these will be only staying at the interface and these will be actually leading to stronger effects on the surface tension okay so in this analysis of course what is done basically the biharmonic equation was solved and in this biharmonic equation then what were the boundary conditions so these boundary conditions were nothing but the kinematic boundary conditions i will not explain now because already we have talked about these boundary conditions in enough detail while we discuss the stokes flow and the uh, head merge solution okay this particular boundary condition is one which is coming because of the this is coming because of the tangential stress okay so this is coming because of the tangential stress now in this boundary condition what we have if you see in the right hand side we used to have one term called as surface gradient of sigma and this surface gradient of sigma is considered actually zero so this was the boundary condition whenever we are saying that we have surface contamination then this boundary condition will not be is this point clear so in case of head merge solution what we have done we considered this particular boundary condition and this was nothing but the balance of tangential stresses particularly by mentioning that we are not having any surface contamination present in the system but if there is surface contamination then these two tangential stresses will not be equal but these must have this gradient of surface tension over sigma so that's why when we are considering the effect of con contamination into account then this particular boundary condition will not be applicable okay so to replace this boundary condition what we will be doing now we will have one boundary condition in terms of theta so i told you in the previous lecture that whenever a particle is actually rising in a continuous medium what will be happening contaminants will try to settle down close to the close to the rear wall portion okay so because of this here i will be having different surface tension here i will be having different surface tension and i will be finding some sort of stagnant zone over here so in this particular portion i will be having a stagnant zone okay so that's why what i have done i have defined one variable theta not so theta not is the variable from the upstream to the point where stagnant zone is actually starting okay so when my angle is from 0 to theta not in this portion i will be having shear free boundary condition where there will be free circulation but when my theta not is theta is from theta not to pi so this particular portion in this portion i will be having stagnant fluid so if i am having stagnant fluid then tangential velocity must be equal to zero so u theta is equal to zero okay so whatever the boundary condition we were having which were applicable for contaminant free system now when we are considering the contaminant then we have to see up to what extent in the angular direction our actually surface is contaminated and after that portion actually what we have to do we have to specify nothing but our no slip boundary condition which will be present because of the stagnant that system okay so with this analysis if you solve your equations then you will be finding your terminal velocity to be this is the existing formula 
multiplied with some coefficient y theta naught and this y theta naught will be actually depending upon the portion up to which we have contamination and in majority of the situations if you see if you plot the value of y which is nothing but ut terminal velocity of the particle divided by terminal velocity of contaminant free system so there you will be finding sorry uh, terminal velocity of stokes flow so this is terminal velocity of stokes flow where there is no internal circulation so if you calculate this factor y its value is actually shown over here so this is the graph which is given by saving okay so in this graph you can see that for the lower values of theta naught for lower values of theta naught what is the meaning lower value of theta naught is means major portion of the surface is actually contaminated if major portion of the surface is contaminated then in major portion i will be having stagnant flow without any internal recirculation if in major portion of the particle i have a uh, stagnant fluid then my solution will be close to that of a solid particle solution so that's why i am having here this ratio of terminal velocity of fluid particle to stokes terminal velocity close to 1 when value of theta naught is increasing it means the extent of contamination is actually decreasing then my value of fluid particle is actually uh, value of velocity terminal velocity of fluid particle is increasing because now in more portion we are actually experiencing the circulation and lesser portion is stagnant and at very high values close to 180 degrees once again we will be approaching to hadmar uh, solution for terminal velocity okay so in this case you can see that from the values greater than 3 pi by 4 this solution is almost becoming asymptotic and this asymptotic solution can be given by this particular equation okay and how sevik has obtained the value of theta naught so sevik has performed some experiments and from their experiments they tried to identify the circulations within the they tried to capture the circulations within the particle and the portion of the particle where they were not able to see the circulations then using image analysis actually they found the value of theta naught so theta naught values are calculated experimentally experimentally using the image analysis so first experimentally they tried to capture the internal circulations and after that they have performed image analysis to calculate the value of theta naught okay so you can see this experiment is done long back so at that time also they actually somehow tried to perform image analysis and obtain a good estimate of the terminal velocity okay then this is another people uh, griffith particularly what they have done they have specified that terminal velocity can be written in terms of terminal velocity for stokes flow times 1 plus z by 2 where z is nothing but called as circulation factor and value of this circulation factor can be written something like this where this y is obtained from the sevix solution and they have proposed this new line which is more closer to the experiment is this point clear so the use of circulation pattern is actually following the same solution base solution of the sevier only but what they have done here they have simply tried to modify this solution with the help of circulation factor so that actually uh, there is more close agreement with the experimental data so that is something which they have actually tried to do over here okay now comes one more important point which is called as osin's approximation okay so basically whenever we have assumed the whenever we have assumed the in uh, this one uh, inertia free motion okay so creeping flow assumption so in the creeping flow assumption actually convective term we have completely removed from our governing equations okay so the order of magnitude analysis tells that order of that neglected term is nothing but equal to renault number times r by a so this is the order of convective term 
which we have neglected. Is this point clear? So this is the neglected convective term. So this term will be of small in magnitude when my radial distance is less than a by r e. Is this point clear? And when my radius is, radial distance is greater than a by r e, then the magnitude of this term will dominate and what we can say is when we are moving sufficiently away from the particle, there the relative importance of viscous effect will decrease. So that's why fluid inertia will become actually important. Is this point clear? So whenever we are very close to the particle, even in case of creeping flow situation also, when we are moving sufficiently away from the particle in the radial direction, means if my particle is here and if I go to some place here. So what we have done in the entire flow field, we have assumed that we have nothing but no inertia present in the system. Okay, But I will be having some domain which is having radius less than A by R E and then some domain which is having radius greater than A by R E. So particularly in this domain, I will be having this assumption of neglected inertia valid, but outside this assumption of neglected inertia will not be valid. Okay, So that is why this term, the neglected convective term will become dominant and ultimately we will be having some error in our solution. So Osin was the first one who pointed out this uh, effect and later on in his solution actually he has considered convective term. So what Osin mentioned, Osin has written velocity vector in terms of v minus u i. So ultimately what we said, we said that at sufficiently away from the interface we have only velocity equal to u. But that was not the situation where velocity was something deviated from u. So this v over here nothing but represent how much deviation we have from the free stream velocity. Okay. So in this case then he tried to calculate the derivative of this du by dt. So this u I will be replacing with v minus ui, where this ui represents the component in the direction of the flow. Okay. So if you do this derivative on this particular velocity field, then you will be finding your steady, you are considering steady analysis, that is why you are not considering the time derivative, you are only considering the spatial derivative. So you will be finding spatial derivative v vector dot divergence of v minus ui dot divergence of v. Okay. So in this case then what he has done, he considered that this first term is actually neglected. After that he has also neglected but he has neglected after doing this expansion. First term neglected and second term which is having ui times gradient of v this he has considered that it should be taken into account. Okay. So using this, we will be now getting our, so earlier this only this much was our governing equation. Now in this governing equation, we also have some additional term which is coming because of this particular effect. Okay. Is this one clear? So now again what we are saying, we are saying that our Reynolds number is small. It means our flow is in the creeping resign only, but still what we are doing, we are considering one of the inertia term so that at the distance sufficiently away from the particle, whatever the small inertia effect is coming because of the presence of finite renewal number, we should be able to account for that inertia effect. Okay. If I consider the effect finite Reynolds number effect in entire domain then I cannot even neglect this first term. Then I have to consider this first term also. Okay. But the assumption is that we are completely in the creeping flow resign only but at distances sufficiently away from the solid boundary we are considering small inertia effect which is coming because of the Okay. So now of course, these will be my boundary conditions. So these are very clear to all kinematic boundary condition. So when you are sufficiently away from the R, 
then my velocity will be equal to free stream velocity only and this deviation from the free stream velocity will be equal to 0 and uh, particularly at r equal to a at r equal to a my velocity whatever will be coming at the surface that will be nothing but equal to ui okay and the solution of this equation is given by so osin has given the equations and the solution is given by first lamb okay so this is called as lamb's solution this is popularly known as osin's approximation and lamb's solution so according to lamb this is now the new value of psi so if you see up to this this is identical to stokes solution and after this you have the terms which are coming because of the effect of Reynolds okay and particularly you will be finding if you consider your value of r is significantly less than a by r e then these terms will become close to zero so ultimately solution will again shift towards the stokes solution sir ek bar small small v jo hai okay small v means it is nothing but whenever your flow field is approaching to the surface then how much deviation is there in the flow field other than the v is this one clear so u is your say this is your u free stream velocity this is u this is your particle okay so if this is the zone close to a by r what is our assumption that outside this zone within this zone we will be having creeping flow and earlier we were considering that outside this zone also we are having the creeping flow dominant it means we will be having very small disturbance presence because of the when particle is actually moving inside that but what we are saying that in this particular zone my velocity will be having stronger deflection from the mean flow velocity and whatever that deflection is there that is accounted in terms of v minus u i so that is my total velocity okay so in earlier case our assumption was that velocity should remain only u but now velocity is actually not remaining exactly u but it is deviating by some factor so that deviation is actually accounted over here okay so now here you can see that if my r is very very small in comparison to a by re then value of psi is nothing but again approaching to the stokes solution and this is the order of the neglected term which is r e renold number into r by k now here you can see one interesting fact that earlier your pressure field was actually only having this first part now pressure field is having renold number by 4 into 3 cos square theta minus 1 okay and similarly if you calculate the surface vorticity so surface vorticity is also having actually this particular addition of the renold number what is its effect so if you now plot the surface vorticity as function of angle so say this is your particle this from this direction you are measuring the angle so this will be theta and at this point theta will be equal to 90 okay and at this rearward point theta will be equal to 180 degree so here you can see that stokes solution gives completely symmetric completely symmetric this line is nothing but a stokes solution so as per this solution your non dimensionalized vorticity is actually very symmetric about this point okay but when you consider the effect of renold number then you can see that this vorticity is increasing in the upstream direction and whenever you go in the downstream 
then it is up to some extent it is higher and after that it is going below the Stokes approximation. Is this point clear? All are clear with this idea. What we have is that Stokes solution is giving symmetric distribution of the surface vorticity. That on both the sides of this angle we have actually same value of vorticity. On contrary, whenever you are considering the effect of Reynold number, okay, so Osin solution. So as per Osin solution, in the upstream portion, the value of surface vorticity is actually greater. And in the downstream direction, below theta equal to 90 degree, up to some portion vorticity magnitude is higher, but after that vorticity magnitude is actually so it means that the use of inertia is nothing but makes our vorticity distribution or in other sense velocity distribution or pressure distribution asymmetric. Okay. So that is the reason if you consider high Reynolds number then what we experience? We experience flow separation in the rear wall direction. Okay. So what happens? Your Streamline comes like this and then here you have so many circulations because of the flow separation effect. So that will be coming at finite Reynolds number. So right now our Reynolds number is not that high that we are having flow separation. It means streamlines are following this one only. But the shape of the streamline will not be symmetric whatever we have in upstream direction and the downstream direction. There will be some change in the shape and which will be actually leading to presence of asymmetry. But one important point is that the point of peak vorticity, peak surface vorticity will be shifting towards the upstream direction. Okay. And corresponding to 90 degree we will be saying that the value of vorticity is less in comparison to the peak vorticity and after that there will be drastic decrease in the value. And this is shown here for two values of Reynolds number. One is for Reynolds number equal to 0.5 and then Reynolds number equal to 1. Of course, for smaller Reynolds number, the deviation from Stokes solution is small and when your Reynolds number is large, then deviation from the Stokes solution is actually large. Okay. Then typically you can see that depending upon the Osin's approximation, of course, there will be difference in the magnitude of the drag holes also. Okay. So, considering this, what was your Stokes drag force? 24 by Reynolds number. So, now we have this 3 by 16 times Re as additional factor which is coming because of the Poisson's approximation. And if you calculate Cd by Cdst, like Cd for actual situation divided by Cd for Stokes minus 1, then this is the additional factor and uh, this ratio for different values of Reynolds number is actually shown over here. So you can see for Reynolds number up to 1, this is this ratio is actually almost very close for different types of solutions provided by different people. But whenever your Reynolds number is increasing, then there is significant departure from the Stokes solution. So over here, what I am doing is actually I have given you one table where these different solutions which people have done. So, OSIN has only considered one order higher, then later on people have actually gone with the even including more higher order terms. For example, this second solution is including Reynolds number square as well, Reynolds number cube as well. So, this solution was given by Goldstein using the OSIN's approximation. Okay. So, means earlier they were neglecting one term, then he has considered few more terms into the consideration. So, if you consider more number of terms, of course, your, there will be improvement in your solution. So, you will be finding that in this particular zone, your all the solutions will be coming close to each other, but away from that, there will be strong deviation from the Stokes solution. Okay. And also, in this zone, actually, we are also not very much interested in considering these solutions because majorly these are driven with the creeping flow approximation and after this point creeping flow approximation does not be actually applicable. Okay. So, the, you can refer this particular uh, uh, chart. So, what should be there say in the exam you can expect a question that this table is given 
and then some flow situation is given for which you have to calculate the drag force. So you have to choose and decide that which formula actually you need to select. Is this point clear? So that type of question may come. Okay, once we consider the, uh, once we consider this uh, flow dynamics, then one parallel thing is nothing but heat transfer also. Okay, so if you have a creeping flow situation where <clears throat> uh, your particle is interacting with the surrounding fluid, then there will be heat transfer if there is difference of temperature between the particle and the surrounding. So to account for heat transfer in creeping motion, of course I have given you the formulation of detailed energy equation and in that detailed energy equation if you consider the pure Stokes assumption then only one term we have to solve. What will be that term? If you have a complete energy equation and if you assume that you are having pure creeping flow situation, then which term of the energy equation you need to solve? only diffusive term. Okay, so if you consider pure Stokes flow, then only term will be conductivity into Laplacian of T. So only this term will be nothing but giving me the solution of the temperature flow. But if I say that whenever particle will be moving, slightly it will be creating some motion around this, means inertia also if I account for. Then what will be happening? I have to consider the advection term as well. Okay. So that is done over here. So this equation is nothing but combined advection diffusion equation. What is this equation? Combined advection diffusion equation. Here right hand side is nothing but representing the diffusion and left hand side is representing the advection. So if you see particularly in the advection term I have not accounted for velocity in all directions. Why? Because advection will be majorly dominant in the direction of the flow. So that's why while defining the advection term, only one direction is considered which is in the direction of the flow. Is this one clear? So it means that whatever this solution is, this is close to the Poisson's approximation. Okay. When you non-dimensionalize this equation, you will be finding the ratio of these properties k, this rho Cp ul by k, which will come as nothing but products of Reynolds number into parental number and this is called as Peclet number. Okay. And Peclet number, what does it represent? It represent storage of heat, rho Cp is storage of heat. This is conduction of heat and this U effect is actually also representing the advection. So in this Peclet number, if you try to calculate the mean Nusselt number of the flow, mean Nusselt number for this heat transfer will be Q bar W. What is Q bar? Q bar is, so of course whenever a particle is actually approaching the flow, then it may happen that in one portion of the particle, rate of heat transfer will be different. In other portion of the particle, rate of heat transfer will be different. But ultimately, if we have to come up with the overall effect, then we will be interested in identifying the average there. Okay. So if you calculate average heat flux, which is across this entire surface, that is given as nothing but Q bar. Okay. So this is nothing but definition of Nusselt number. So I think all of you have studied heat transfer. So Nusselt number definition will be Q bar W divided by thermal conductivity times Tw minus T infinity by L. Is this point clear? And from this solution, if you calculate the Nusselt number using this equation and this formulation, you will be finding for a spherical particle value of Nusselt number is 2 plus 0.5 into Reynolds number parental number plus Reynolds number square terms we have actually neglected. Is this point clear? So this solution we will be calling as nothing but Osin's solution for heat transfer equation. Okay. Is this point clear?
this will be coming as ocean solution for heat transfer equation is this one clear now if i plot this nusselt number as function of the renold number then you will be finding that this is the equation okay so in this equation what is happening this is ocean's equation so ocean's equation and these points over here nothing but represents the experimental data okay so here you can see that if you curve fit this experimental data then curve fit of the experimental data is actually matching close to the ocean solution particularly in the regime of very low renold number and when your renold number is actually becoming finite then this solution is deviating and the reason is obvious because then we have to consider advection in other directions then only we will be able to find the complete solution one important point is if you just do curve fit of this data then you can approximate nusselt number for entire range of renold number as 2 plus 0.3 parental number 1 by 3 in renold number points so if you see majority of your convective heat transfer solutions can be given in terms of for external flow situations what are the formulation of nusselt number typically in terms of parental and renold and majority of the time for external flow you will be finding parental 1 by 3 and renold 2 by 3 okay yes it depends upon value of parental number it, we have to change that coefficient sometimes 1 by 3 sometimes 1 by 2 so for heating it is 1 by 3 for cooling it is 1 by 3 so that is there but so we are actually coming towards that order okay so it means that this ocean's approximation will be only applicable for very small value of renold number and if you are going for higher renold number then you have to do and go for some empirical relation because ultimately the solution at finite renold numbers is actually not available so that is one of the analytical solution is not available then we have to go for either experiments or we have to go for numerical solution okay and another important aspect is that if you see this equation this equation is nothing but completely decoupled from your momentum equation is this one clear what i am saying this equation is decoupled from momentum equation the meaning is what are the terms this equation is involving u u is nothing but free stream velocity rho cp are fluid properties k is fluid property and laplacian of temperature field okay so it means it is only involving a single unknown parameter temperature where this free stream velocity u is actually already known to us okay so it means for finding out the solution of this equation we need not to rely on solution of momentum equation on contrary if you consider the finite renold number case and then if you want to determine the numerical solution then what will be happening you have to consider velocities in all directions so if you have to solve energy equation then you should know values of velocities in all directions and to determine the values of velocities in all directions what you have to do you have to first find the solution of momentum equation so it means that one important sort question is there like if you consider the creeping flow situation then your energy equation is nothing but decoupled from the momentum equation to determine the solution of this equation you need not to solve your momentum equation but at finite renold number what will be happening because velocities will be considered in all the directions so to account for the effect of the velocities what will be happening effect of solution of momentum equation is actually required 
Okay, so whenever you do your heat transfer course, particularly in convection course, what we do first? First we solve the momentum equation, then whatever the values of velocity we get from the momentum equation, that we substitute in the energy equation to find out the temperature flow. Okay, so it means their equations are actually coupled to momentum equation. But for creeping flow situation, this is decoupled. So solution is not needed. Okay, so now uh, as I already told you that non-spherical particles are not of our much interest because uh, of course we will be talking about the non-spherical fluid particles but you will be experiencing that whenever you have a non-spherical fluid particle then your assumption of creeping flow will be very less applicable and wherever you will be finding that smaller amount of inertia is present then you cannot actually approximate the particle as of constant shape. Then you will be having significant change in the shape of the particle depending upon the surrounding inertia. Okay. So particularly for high Reynolds number, uh, we will be finding that fluid particles will not be actually having uh, the constant shapes and there what we need to do, we, uh, uh, particles will not be existing in the spherical shape because particles will be deviating from the spherical shape. On contrary, uh, whenever we are talking about the rigid particles, so rigid particles can also be in uh, <coughs> multiple other shapes, but how to find out the uh, solution for non-spherical rigid particles that is not of our much interest because that type of solution will be interested for those who are uh, uh, interested in liquid solid or gas solid flow. Here in this particular course, majorly we will be talking about the gas liquid flows. But still in order to complete the topic, I will just give you a brief recapitulation in some slides. So as I told you earlier also that uh, our major interest is to define and compare the drag of uh, non-spherical particles in terms of spherical particles. So if I say that actual drag on the particle divided by drag on equivalent sphere of at the same velocity, then I call this ratio as nothing but my drag ratio. Okay, and similarly, I also called one factor which is called as settling factor. Settling factor is given by symbol S, and it is nothing but terminal velocity of the actual non-spherical particle divided by terminal velocity of equivalent sphere of same density. And you will be finding that this S E can be written in terms of delta E minus 1 if you consider this equivalence in terms of volume equivalent particles. Is this one clear? So earlier I told you there are other uh, different criteria. In some cases we can have projected area equivalence. In some cases we can have surface area equivalence. In some, some cases we can have volume equivalence. Okay. So, I also gave you brief description earlier about the class of the particle. So particularly if you have orthotropic particles then you can expect that they have no preferred orientation and they always fall without rotation. Because what were isotropic particles, uh, sorry orthotropic particles like our cuboid. So in case of cuboid there are three planes of symmetry and each plane of symmetry is dividing the body into two equal halves. Okay, in any orientation. So that is why you place cuboid in any direction every time you will be experiencing the same type of velocity and shape is so symmetric that all the forces will be balanced and you will not be experiencing any rotation. So that is why the motion of this type of particles will be purely vertical if one of the symmetry plane is horizontal. Okay. Then axisymmetric particles these fall vertically when axis is vertical. But if the particle is axisymmetric as well as orthotropic, then it can fall vertically even if axis of symmetry is horizontal and it will be moving without rotation because that is the fundamental nature of the orthotropic particle. So one important point is axisymmetric particles will fall vertically only if axis is parallel to vertical. But if the particle is axisymmetric as well as orthotropic then it can fall vertically even when the axis of symmetry are horizontal okay and uh, otherwise it will be falling without rotation 
when its uh, axis, axis is vertical and it will only be stable. Then we have spherically isotropic particles. So particles which fall vertically without any rotation and their settling velocity is independent of their orientation. These particles are called as spherically isotropic particle. If your particle is not following any of the above assumptions, then you will be having spiral tra trajectory and particle may either rotate or wobble. So it will not be having a straight trajectory. Okay. And uh, drag and torque on an arbitrary particle which is, so if your particle is of arbitrary shape, not following all these rules of symmetry, then you cannot ensure always the pure translation of the particle. Then along with the translation, there can be rotation of the particle. Okay. So drag and torque on arbitrary particles which are translating and rotating in unbounded stagnant fluid, these are de determined by three second order tensors and the values of these tensors depend upon the shape of the body. Okay, so what are these tensors? First, we can have translation of the body. So there will be some force, some drag force because of translation of the body. Okay, so that's why we will be having one symmetric translation tensor which will be giving the resistance to the translation motion. Then another we can have rotation. So a symmetric rotational tensor which will be nothing but giving the torques which are originating because of the rotation. And third type of drag force will be coming a symmetric coupling tensor which defines torques resulting from translation and drag force. So what, what is done? There can be combined effect of translation and rotation. So whatever the forces which will be coming because of the combined effect these will be actually resulting in a asymmetric tensor. Okay. And uh, if you have to determine the drag force acting on a particle only because of the translation, then we know that drag force on a particle is nothing but 6 pi mu au. So here you can see 6 pi a are nothing but constants, u is velocity and mu is viscosity. So it means that drag force can be approximated as some constant times viscosity and velocity. Is this point clear? So what is done over here, drag force is actually written in terms of minus mu i c1 u1. So u1 is velocity in ith direction and c1 is corresponding symmetric translational tensor okay which is which will be coming as a constant value in that particular direction then second is j times u2 u2 is velocity in yth direction and c2 is tensor okay which is in component of the tensor because of translation in j uh, in uh, jth direction and similarly, C3 is constant in k direction. So all these three factors, their vector sum will be giving me the total drag force. And this drag force I have written, this is nothing but only because of the pure translation. Okay, because now body is not having symmetry, so it will not be moving in particular direction. So because of the asymmetry, body can be oriented in any direction and it can have velocity components in all the three directions. So we have to estimate drag force components in all the directions and then combined as a vector sum. Okay. And radius of the particle. So that will be considered as the equivalent particle settling factors whatever we have seen earlier. In one direction it is projected area and then it is vector. So this is typical representation of an axisymmetric particle. So here you can see the particle is non-spherical but about this axis it is nothing but symmetric. Okay. So what you can have, you can say that the particle is having velocity, this is nothing but total velocity vector. So this velocity vector is in any arbitrary direction which is at an angle theta. 
and because of this velocity total drag force fd is acting in any arbitrary direction which is at an angle phi from the which is at an angle phi from the axis and this fd can be divided into two components fd1 and fd2 so fd1 is component which is parallel to the axis and fd2 is component which is perpendicular to the axis and let us consider that this is moving without rotation it is without rotation so in this case what will be happening fd1 will be mu c1 into mu c1 into u will be my factor and its component in which direction parallel to axis will be nothing but cos theta and perpendicular to axis will be sin theta so your total drag force will be resultant of these two so resultant of these two that's why you are having some square and then square root of the sum quantity and you have to find out the direction of in which this drag force is acting that will be c2 by c1 into tan theta so this is the value of phi okay now in this case you have to consider that all the particle uh, this uh, particle is of homogeneous density okay because of which this drag force point will only act at the centroid of the particle so if it is acting at the center of mass of the particle then only you will not be having any rotation if you consider that your density is not homogeneous then what will happen drag force and weight can be at located at different different locations and you will be having the rotation of the particle is this point clear so basic idea is whenever you will be doing the non spherical shapes then we will be having actually significant challenges when we will be talking about the individual particles so what we have to do is we have to consider a generic arbitrary configuration and then we have to decide the principal directions okay so for axisymmetric case we will be having only two principal directions if we are having a three dimensional object then we will be having three principal directions and then we have to account for component of velocities and forces in all the principal directions to determine their vectors okay so for this particular case uh, i have given you the values of terminal velocity also so this is the value of terminal velocity and these are nothing but the components of the terminal velocity parallel to and perpendicular to the flow direction okay so this part is just for your understanding and to show you that once we deviate from sphere, uh, symmetric spherical shape to non spherical shape then how many challenges we are having though i have included many other things about non spherical particles in this slide but i will not discuss because ultimately uh, we are not going to discuss much about non spherical say solid particles in this particular course whenever we will be discussing about the non spherical fluid particles there i will discuss the things in detail okay is this one clear and mostly uh, because uh, here for solid particles the solutions are tried based on the analytical approach and whenever we will be considering the non spherical fluid particles then solutions are majorly based on the numerical approach okay because there you will be finding that analytical solutions are not possible okay so uh, that's why let me stop at this point and we will discuss uh, quickly about uh, effect of uh, finite enrolled number on the solid spheres in the next lecture and then we will slowly deviate towards the uh, fluid particles which are of actually our main interest for this particular course okay